An assault rifle is a selective fire individual weapon. When fired semi-automatic, it is intended to fill the role of the infantryman's battle rifle, and when fired on full automatic, it is intended to do better than the submachine gun. In order to make such a thing work, compromises are necessary. Most assault rifles are chambered for a class of cartridges which falls roughly midway between the pistol cartridges, such as the 9mm Parabellum that are used in the submachine guns, and the full-powered rifle cartridges, such as the 8mm Mauser, caliber 30, and 762 NATO, which are used in rifles and machine guns. The basic idea got its start in the period 1936 to 38, when the Germans conducted experiments with scaled down sporting rifle cartridges. Concepts for use of these cartridges proceeded slowly. By 1942, however, the Germans were confronted with virtual human wave attacks on the Eastern Front. Their shortage of manpower was such that frontages of 1,000 yards for a squad were not unusual. This means that an individual rifleman would have to cover a front of 80 to 100 yards, armed only with his bolt-action rifle. His nearest fire support would be the MG-34 in his squad, which might well be five or 600 yards away. These realities and other demands gave impetus to a German search for a greater volume of fire on the part of the individual soldier. To make a long story short, the Germans designed a selective fire individual weapon which was chambered for their reduced power cartridge from the 1930s. They named the weapon Sturmgewehr, literally translated assault rifle. The assault rifle was and is intended to give the individual soldier a selective fire capability. The hope is that when firing semi-automatic, he can fire as a rifleman, and when firing full automatic, he will at least outrange and otherwise do better than a submachine gun. Our purpose here is not to talk about the history of the assault rifle. You have watched a number of these weapons tapes and should have assimilated a historically based methodology for the evaluation of the strengths and weaknesses of any weapon and its employment in light of these strengths and weaknesses. Consequently, we will show two assault rifles and one main battle rifle and then leave you with some questions. The first weapon you will see is the AK-47. It is the preferred weapon of the Soviet bloc, and it is believed that something in excess of 40 million have been made. It is chambered for the 7.62 by 39 Russian short cartridge. This cartridge fires a 123 grain bullet at approximately 2,400 feet per second. In rough terms, this gives it approximately 60% of the energy and effect of the 7.62 NATO at the muzzle. Due to the lighter bullet's poor ballistic coefficient, the 7.62 by 39 Russian short suffers severe degradation due to air resistance. In exchange for all this, it is selective fire. The second rifle you will see is the US M16A1. It is chambered for the 5.56 by 45 millimeter cartridge firing a 55 grain bullet at 3120 feet per second. This gives it a bit less than 50% of the energy of the 7.62 NATO at the muzzle, and due to its extremely poor ballistic coefficient, this percentage decreases still further due to air resistance. It does have some greater effect than numbers would indicate due to its muzzle velocity being over the threshold of 3,000 feet per second. However, since the ballistic coefficient is so poor and the velocity decays rapidly, this effect is all but gone by the time the bullet gets 80 or 90 yards downrange. In exchange for this, however, the recoil impulse from the 5.56 millimeter cartridge is less than that of the 7.62 NATO. 
The third weapon you will see is the M14 rifle chambered for the 7.62 by 51 NATO cartridge. This cartridge fires a 150 grain bullet at 2750 feet per second. It is the equivalent of the full powered rifle rounds which you have seen from the Boer War through World War II. The recoil from this cartridge is heavy enough so that full automatic fire from a 10 pound weapon is a virtual impossibility. Each of these weapons will engage the same targets in sequence. First will be three pop-up targets at 75 yards, followed by an area suppression target at 280. Then will come two pop-up targets at 330 yards, and for the M14 only, a single stationary target at 680 yards. Let's take a look. A couple of things are readily evident from the tape. First, the M14 rifle is certainly capable of delivering accurate and effective fire to ranges far beyond what the other two are capable of. At 680 yards, the M14 scored 11 hits out of 16 rounds. Secondly, though the AK-47 and the M16A1 can be fired full automatic, 
it would appear that there is difficulty in controlling the automatic fire. In all cases, the bursts of fire defined a fairly large beaten zone, a more stable position and a shooting sling which neither weapon is equipped with might help, but the beaten zone from full automatic bursts would still be very large. On the chart, the bolt action, Garand, and M14 all have roughly the same combat range. The AK-47 and M16A1 suffer a disadvantage here. I might add that the 400 yards for the M16 adjust sight range assumes a trained rifleman and a still day. The M16A1 does not have sights adjustable for range and it requires Kentucky windage. Further, the ballistic coefficient of the bullet is so poor that given a crosswind, the M16 bullet blows severely and erratically and a hit at 400 yards in a wind is quite an iffy thing. The volume of fire has obviously increased from the bolt action to the grand to the 40 rounds per minute of the M14. With full automatic bursts, the AK-47 and M16A1 are up to 60 rounds per minute. The M14's only advantage over the Garand is its 20 round detachable box magazine, which reduces time lost from reloading the weapon, and its hook butt plate, which tends to keep the weapon stable on the shoulder. However, 40 rounds per minute certainly pushes what the trained rifleman can do. If the rifleman hit with every round, and had to shift to a new target after every shot, he would not be able to get 40 rounds per minute. When firing suppression, 40 rounds per minute is feasible and limited only by heat buildup. We show both the M16A1 and AK-47 at 60 rounds per minute. For short periods of time, say three to four minutes, they can be fired on full automatic at much higher volumes of fire. However, this may not be controllable fire. Further, the AK-47 and M16 fire from the closed bolt and have relatively little mass in the barrel. They heat up badly and this limits the sustained volume of fire. The follow-on weapon to the M16A1, the M16A2, will have roughly the same volume of fire but an improved combat range due to its heavier bullet and faster twist. The Soviet follow-on weapon, the AK-74, will likewise have the same sustained volume but will actually suffer a degradation in combat range due to the light 5.45 millimeter cartridge. With your new M16A2, you will have parity with the AK-47 or be slightly superior to the AK-74. There are basically two schools of thought concerning the assault rifle. One school is that the assault rifle is neither fish nor fowl. The cartridges for the assault rifle give up so much in power that they do not qualify for effective long range rifle fire. On the other hand, they still have enough recoil so that the controlled accurate bursts of the submachine gun are non-existent. The opposing school of thought holds that the assault rifle is the optimum blend of all weapons characteristics. The average rifleman cannot hit anything beyond 400 yards or will not be able to see anything beyond 400 yards and therefore there is no reason to give him a rifle which will shoot beyond 400 yards. In exchange for this acknowledgement of reality, full automatic capability is more than worthwhile. What do you think? You have seen many weapons in these tapes. You have seen examples of leaders who tailored their organization and tactical plan to take advantage of the strengths of their weapons and shield themselves from the weaknesses. What are the strengths and weaknesses of an assault rifle? If the AK-47 and M16A2 have parity, and yet the enemy armed with the AK-47 outnumbers you greatly, under what conditions will you join battle? What will you do to give yourself the winning edge? Does the edge lie in training and morale? If so, does that tend to undercut the idea 
that the soldier will not be able to shoot past 400 yards. At one time, the U.S. Army could certainly do so. Perhaps the winning edge lies not within the rifle, but in the other weapons that are present, such as artillery or tanks or something else. If so, then what does the infantry do? If the M16A2 has parity with the AK-47 in both combat range and volume of fire, then any engagement within M16 range is by definition decisive. How much of a winning edge must you have to accept decisive engagement with a numerically superior enemy? When you ask that question, then ask yourself what Daniel Morgan or Custer or Edward III or Robert E. Lee would have answered. The question is obviously quite complex and goes far beyond the consideration of the rifles alone. It must encompass not only weapons, but the training of the individual soldier and even the society from which he comes. The point is that throughout history, no weapon has ever done everything. Every weapon has a unique set of advantages and disadvantages. You must take advantage of the strengths and shield yourself from the weaknesses. There are adequate historical examples to guide you. Regardless of the results of your analysis concerning the assault rifle, I would urge you to carefully consider the questions. In watching these tapes, you have received a good background in the history of weapons, their characteristics, and their effect on the battlefield. Whatever you do, ensure that you have the winning edge. Battle is not conducted on Queensberry rules. Whenever lives are at stake, only a fool or a desperate man will fight on even odds. You must ensure that you have the winning edge.